I'm speaking with Keith Devlin. Keith is a professor of mathematics at Stanford University, but he's probably best known for his frequent appearances as the math guy on national public radio. He's the co-founder and executive director of Stanford's H-Star Institute, which is dedicated to finding ways to make technology more useful and more user-friendly. Keith has won numerous awards, including the Carl Sagan Prize for Popularizing Science, and he's also written 28 books. I'd like to talk a little bit about Stanford's H-Star Institute, of which you are the executive director, mm -hmm. as well as one of the co-founders. What exactly is the purpose of the H-Star Institute? Okay, so the name stands for Human Sciences and Technologies Advanced Research, and when we came uh, when we came up with the title, we were very careful about putting those words in the right order. First of all, it's human sciences, followed by technologies. And what we look at is ways of making technologies easier to use, more beneficial to society. We all know that in, in many cases, technology, the classic case is the DVD recorder that mm -hmm. nobody knows how to operate using the remote. Um, technologies are... are like, are incredibly difficult to use. You know, you often need a, the manual to operate a device properly is very often bigger than the manual itself. So we, we, we face this problem of difficult to use technologies. On the other hand, digital technologies in particular are infinitely malleable. And so it, all it takes to turn those technologies into useful ones is understanding better how people use them, how they don't like to use them, how their lives are changed by having those technologies. You see, one of the problems is this. People have, a, you know, a business will see that someone has a need and they'll try to build something to meet that need. However, what happens is once you build something to help people do something they did without it, the situation has changed mm -hmm. because they're now doing different things with what you've given them. It's not the case that they had a problem, you've provided technology, they can use it to solve that problem. You've provided the technology and you've changed the context in which they operate and it's no longer that they need to solve that problem as such new problems have arisen. And seeing that in advance is very difficult. Typically, if a company has spent billions of dollars developing a product, they introduce it and people don't use it because it's changed things sufficiently that they no longer need to do what they were doing before, then you, you know, it's too expensive to go back and re-engineer it. Much better if in advance you can see, or at least get some idea of how that new technology might affect people's lives, how they might respond to it, so that in spending, instead of spending billions of dollars developing that one, you modify it so that you're more likely to have a home run in terms of something that people want to use. Now, what's the relationship between the H-Star Institute and companies that manufacture electronic products? For example, let's say you're a manufacturer of, say, Philips, for example, mm -hmm. of uh, DVD players. Uh, you obviously want to make them as user-friendly as possible because you want to sell as many of them as possible. So don't you have your own people already working on this problem? What does an organization like H-Star <coughs> add to them? Do they, do they hire you to say, study this problem for us? Yeah. Interesting enough, H-Star was developed after we'd introduced something called MediaX. MediaX was an industry partners program that put companies like Philips and, and Microsoft and other companies, put them together with Stanford faculty and researchers to work on Blue Skies projects. So for 10 years, we've been, we've been operating with industry through our MediaX program. Over the course of those 10 years, we've recognized the kind of problems that companies were talking to us about. And we said, OK, we now know enough about what the playing field looks like that we can create a fully-fledged research institute at Stanford, the H-Star Institute, that looks at that from an academic perspective. So H-Star deals in pure research on its own. But through our MediaX program, which, which we grandfathered as a, as a partner, as, as part of ourselves as an institute, we do, in fact, talk to industry all the time. Uh, not just industry, but, but foreign governments, looking at the kind of fundamental problems that they're interested in. We're not, we don't do product development. That's the company's job. Mm -hmm. We look at what comes next after the product may be on the market, always getting closer to market, and we try to help companies see in advance where the difficulties might be. And it's, a, it's a remarkable sometimes how difficulties can be foreseen by different experts at Stanford with different perspectives. Do you do anything about the problem of teaching science. Do you feel that science is taught adequately in public schools and you're doing uh, any research in that field? Uh, I personally am doing quite a lot of research in, in, in the case of mathematics education and we've got people at Stanford doing other areas of science education. Um, it, no, science and mathematics are not taught well. It's easy to say that. 
figuring out how to teach it well is actually very difficult, particularly given the speed at which the target is moving. Science and technology and mathematics are moving at breakneck speed. Things change very rapidly. Very difficult to sort of figure out the right way to teach things when the material itself is changing fast and the environment from which our students come is also changing rapidly. Well, there's been a conflict in education between learning by rote, yeah. memorize those dates, uh, regurgitate what you've been told, and teaching critical thinking. Yeah. Now, is critical thinking something that you can taught? And do you have to model it? Do you have to demonstrate it for someone to learn it? Yeah. What little we do know about learning suggests that you need a certain degree of a basic knowledge and facility with that knowledge before you can understand it. So rote learning is completely indispensable because until you've learned sufficient in a rote fashion, you're not able to, to sort of learn to understand it. On the, other stand, on the other hand, we also know that if all you have is rote learning and you don't understand what you've learned, you'll forget it two weeks after you've passed the exam. Mm. So genuine learning involves a mixture of rote learning and understanding. In fact, those of us who've been successful in the learning game and have gone on to be teachers and professors and, 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 and successful people, what have we done? We've used both. We've done rote learning, to gr we've crammed for the exam, but we've also gone back and thought, what's this stuff I've just learnt mean? And we've reflected on it. You need both. Yeah. Now, you were a recipient of the Carl Sagan Prize, which is for popularizing science. Um, what, what was it that you did that earned you that prize, if I might ask? Uh, I think it was just a Lifetime Achievement Award okay, for, for doing lots of things. I've written a lot. Of, of the 28 books that you mentioned, I think about 10 of them are written for a general audience. I've done mm -hmm. my NPR Math Guy. I do radio, TV stuff. Uh, it's just general stuff that I've, uh, that I've always done. And the reason I do it, incidentally, is that I, uh, I didn't have a phenomenally good education. I, I was a, a working-class child in the north of England. Uh, I was just turned on to academia and mathematics in particular by stumbling across some books written for general readers. So when I write for a general audience, the person I'm really writing for is me aged 14 mm -hmm. to 16. So it sounds like you're kind of planting seeds. Uh, if you put ideas out there, if you make science seem friendly, just receiving that impression once might change the direction of a person's life. It, it changed my life, it's changed a few other people's lives. Uh, and every now and then I'll go to a conference and I'll meet someone who's a young professor, or actually these days even a middle-aged professor, and they'll come along and they'll say, I read your book when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and that changed my life. Mm -hmm. And believe me, if you're in education, nothing matches that moment. That's when the ultimate that. uh, satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, it ain't about the royalties. Mm -hmm. You don't get rich writing books mm -hmm. on mathematics for mm -hmm. the general audience. But boy, every now and then you get the genuine richness that you've changed someone's life. Let me ask you one more question about technology. Is there any area of technology that you are most excited about right now that you see as having you know, the greatest potential for the future? Um, I think video game technology, I'm not talking about video games per se, but the mm -hmm. general video game technology, in particular massively multiplayer online games mm -hmm. where thousands of people are online at the same time. Because what we have there is a simulated real environment, an immersive 3D environment, populated by the avatars of real people from around the world. We've never had that before. Before, if you wanted to have the experience of sharing a space and doing things with other people, you had to physically go there and you had to sort of make it possible and you were limited to a relatively small number of people in the space. The fact that we can share the same intellectual space with most of the sensations of living in the real world, with people from around the world that we may never have met, we may never meet, and to do things with them, to exchange ideas and to share experiences, that's incredibly powerful. That's the equivalent of the printing press. The printing press made it possible for one person's words to be read by anybody in the world who gets hold of that printed material. Immersive 3D video games environments make it possible for thousands of people from around the world to experience each other through their avatars in real time. That is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And it will change the world, not just of education, but the world of business, the world we live in in ways we cannot begin to understand now.